Now time to enter into our worship hour. I uh, just wanted to let you all know, uh, it was not advised to me last night about all of this, but we do have a class for the young people from three years of age up to second grade, I believe. So uh, if you are in that age group and would like to take your children back there, that'd be fine and dandy. Uh, the teenagers are going to be back there to help with all of that. And also, we also have an attended nursery as well. So it, all the way up from, I guess you can say zero, all the way up to two. So uh, if you are interested in doing that, um, mothers and fathers, please right now feel free to go ahead and take them to their classes. At the appropriate time, after we sing one more song, right? Uh, we're going to go ahead and have George Spurlock come up and have our opening prayer, and then we'll get into our speaking. Number 519. 519. 519. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his Let's pray together. Our great and glorious God, it is with reverent and humble heart, Father, that we approach your throne of grace, of mercy, and true agape love tonight. Father, we acknowledge with a, grat with a grateful heart your love for us. And we extend, Father, our, our great love for you. Father, we're grateful for the many blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. Father, just our jobs and our homes, Father, all the things that we're blessed with. But God, even more importantly, we're grateful tonight for the many blessings that we enjoy in Christ. Father, it is a true blessing to come together as, as your people tonight. This occasion that, that gathers us from various congregations, Father, to express our unity, our love for one another, and most importantly, our love for you. Father, we're, we're grateful for this congregation who's hosting our spiritual enrichment this year. Father, we thank you for all the work that's gone into the preparation and planning. Father, thank you for this congregation and what she has meant to this area for so many years. Father, I ask that you bless all of our congregations in the local area. Father, as we strive to, to spread the message of your son, Father, in our daily lives and to be that city set up on a hill that cannot be hidden. Father, thank you for rewarding our work, for blessing us and blessing our congregations with, with growth and, Father, with an increase in our faith. Father, I ask that you be with Brother Billy tonight as, as he brings us the, the lesson. Thank you so much for his dedication to you, Father, and to your church. Thank you for just the many 
incredible messages from your word that he has brought to us for so many years. Continue to bless him and his family. Father, we pray for all of those that we know and love who are sick, those that are dealing with various situations in their lives, Father, that you truly know more than we. God, I ask in a special way that you suit unto them just those, stand, those things that they stand in need of most. God, above all else tonight, we want to thank you so much for Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, and how that his sacrifice after that perfect life that was left as an example for us to follow, after he died on the cross to save us from our sins, Father, we're, we're so thrilled and thankful that his resurrection happened, Father, that he overcame death and that we might live with him and with you, Father, for all of eternity with all the saints when this life is over. All of these things we pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand, please. Number 646. 646. Six hundred forty six. When days like a river of tenderness my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll,
is good to be with you tonight. It is good to see all of you here. And I appreciate the invitation to speak on this, the 26th annual Spiritual Growth Workshop. It seems almost impossible that it's been 26 years. Brother Black and I worked on the first of the lectureships that we had. That means when we started, I was about 50 years old. That means that Brother Black was about my age now. And some of you were in diapers. <laughs> but I'm glad that it continues to go on year after year. Today I call David Wheeler. Many of you know David. Most of you know David Wheeler. Lives in Georgia, he and Carolyn. Today was his birthday. He's going to be watching tonight. But I said, David, you and Carolyn be praying for me tonight. While I'm preaching, I know he's going to be praying. We have a subject tonight that I think is, I appreciate the, the assignment tonight, and I trust that we will do it justice. That was a young preacher who, oh, he was so excited. He got excited about everything. And one day, he was going to preach on a text taken from the 22nd chapter of Revelation, verse 20, where John said, I come quickly. He backed up way, way back from the podium, and he would run forward. He said, I come quickly. He did it a second time. And everybody seemed to perk up. He thought, well, I'm going to try that one more time. And he tried it the third time, and he ran forward. I come quickly, and he stumbled. He tripped, and he fell, and the first pew was really close to the, to the stage, and it fell almost in one of the ladies' laps. <laughs> He said, oh, I'm so, he was so embarrassed. He said, she said, don't think anything about it. You warned me three times, but it wouldn't move. <laughs> Let me ask you something tonight. What excites you? What gets you excited? He said, well, I got, a, I got a new job. I'm so excited. Well, that's good. I have a new car. I'm all excited. You know, our, our team went to the championship. I, I, whoa, if, if we could just get that excited in the church, wouldn't that be something? Amen. People get all excited about politics. Did you hear the definition that Gus Nichols gave of politics? He said, poly means many sided and a tick is a blood sucking parasite. <laughs> I don't know what excites you, but the Apostle Paul was excited about the gospel. He wrote to the church in Philippi in chapter 1 of the book of Philippians, verse 12, and he said, I would have you to understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Even in, even in prison, he was excited about the gospel, preaching the gospel. And his enthusiasm for the gospel spread to others. Verse 14 says, Many of the brethren waxing confident by, by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He was so excited, he got other people excited. You see, Paul wanted everyone to have an opportunity to hear the gospel. In Romans 15, verse 19, we learn that he traveled all of the way from Jerusalem to Illyricum. 
which is a journey perhaps some calculate, depending on the route you take, I suppose, between 1,500 and 2,000 miles. And he made that journey because he, because he wanted to fully preach the gospel. And he declared that the gospel is God's power. Our text tonight is in the Romans, the first chapter, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, there is power in the gospel. I think a lot, most of us admire, respect certain powers. We, we should respect civil power, the powers that be. We should respect the power of truth. Unfortunately, not all do. And we should respect the power of first century miracles that were performed to cause men and women to believe in Christ according to John 20, verses 30 and 31. But you know, it takes power to pardon sins. Alexander the, the Great had power. He had so much power that he conquered the world and went because there were no, no more worlds to conquer. And Rome had power to subdue kingdoms. And, but those powers were not able to provide pardon for one's sins. You see, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The power and the only power that leads to forgiveness. The gospel is the power to change our nature, our lives. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 explained that we leave the old man behind and we become a new person. Peter explained in 2 Peter chapter 1 and but verse 4 that we become partakers of the divine nature. The only thing that can do that is the power of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to adopt us into his family. Once we have been born of water and of the spirit, John 3, 5, we are added into his family. 1 John chapter 3 verse 1, Galatians 3 26 and 27. And it is through the power of the gospel of Christ that eventually we will triumph over death, Hades, and the grave. It is constraining power in the gospel. What else would cause a family to pull up their roots, leave family and friends behind, and go into some foreign land to preach the gospel. There's the power of the gospel that causes that kind of change. And it is the power of the gospel that sends a martyr to the stake amidst the flames of mockery. It is the power of the gospel that can make a saint out of the vilest of sinners. It is the power of the gospel that can make an immoral person a good moral person. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 9, Paul, you said, No, you're not the unrighteous, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he gives a litany of sins that would constitute that unrighteous behavior. But in verse 11, he said, And such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified. The only thing that can bring about that kind of change is the gospel. It is the power of God that can change a hater of Christians into a lover of Christians. It is the power of God that can cause a, a persecutor of saints to become a persecuted saint. There is indeed power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, what kind of power? There is power in the gospel to convict one of sin. It was the day of Pentecost. The spokesman, the chief spokesman was the apostle Peter. He's about to preach the first recorded gospel sermon under the worldwide commission. 
On that day, he preaches about Jesus, about Jesus' life, about Jesus' death, about Jesus' resurrection. And then he says to the people gathered there that this, is, this Jesus whom you have crucified, God has made him what? Both Lord and Christ. Think about that. Here the people who earlier had said, crucify him, crucify him. And now they hear a sermon about that one they crucified. And when they heard that, they were pricked in their hearts. There's power in the gospel to prick our hearts. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit of the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. But not only is there power in the gospel to convict us, there is power to convince us. The day go back to the day of Pentecost. They heard that, they were pricked in their hearts. What was their response? Their response was, after they had been convicted, they were convinced they needed to make a change. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? There's power in the gospel to convince us. There is power to convert us. When they asked what to do, they were told, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The parallel to that over in Acts the third chapter and verse 19 reads, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. You see, when we respond to the gospel, we are converted to Jesus Christ. And there is power in the gospel to confirm. That is to strengthen, to edify, to settle us, to establish us. Listen to Acts 20, 32. This is a part of Paul's, a closing part actually, of Paul's address to the Ephesian elders. I commend you to God and the word of his grace, the word of his grace, the gospel, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Folks, there's power in the gospel. The late Willard Collins had a sermon that he called the power of the resurrection gospel. In that sermon, Brother Collins says there is the power of love in the gospel. And there is, isn't there? What is it that causes a man and wife to live together 40, 50, 60, or more years? The love that draws them together. What is it calls uh, uh, some parents to go out to the cemetery? I know this happens. They go to the cemetery every day to the grave of a child that they lost in an, unpassion, in an untimely way. They're drawn back out there because of love. And that which will draw us out of the depths of sin up to the everlasting hills of God is the love of God. There's the power of love in the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Brother Collins also said there's power of sacrifice in the gospel. The gospel presents Jesus as our Passover lamb, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. That he's the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, John 1, 29. That he's the one who was sacrificed. That you and I might live. There's that power of sacrifice. Brother Collins further said there's the power of unity in the gospel. We need something to unify the world, do we not? We need something that can unify our nation. We need something that can unify our communities. We need something that can unify the, the, the religious world today. And it takes the gospel to unify us. In Galatians 3.28, there the apostle Paul said, 
that in Jesus Christ, we're all one in Christ. We're all one in him. There's not male. There's not female. There's not bond. There's not free. Because you see, Jesus Christ is the one who made all one and broke down that middle wall of petition that would separate us. The power of unity in the gospel. Jesus Christ did not die on that cross for a confederation of religious organizations. Because when Jesus died on that cross, he died to unite us as one body in him by his cross. Ephesians 2.16 The power of gospel. That's why Paul was so excited about it. He was so excited about the gospel that he wrote these things in Romans 1. I am a debtor. Both to the Greek and to the barbarian, to the wise and to the unwise. He felt like he owed so much to so many. He owed a lot to God, did he not? He owed a lot to Jesus. We do too, don't we? And he felt that debt so strongly that he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 15 and 16, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Someone asked me one day, Brother Lambert, do you think you were called to preach? I know what they meant. I, I think I know what they meant. Did I get some kind of a small, still voice in the middle of the night? No. But I said, if you mean by that, that I feel like that Billy has to preach to go to heaven. Yes, I've been called to preach. I feel like I have got to preach the gospel to be pleasing to God. Woe is unto me, Paul said, if I preach not the gospel. Then Paul said, I am ready to preach the gospel. Think about it, brethren. At the peril of his own life, he preached the gospel. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 8, he said, we're troubled on every side. In 2 Corinthians 11, he talked about all of the perils that he went through, the stonings, the beatings. You know, that's enough to put the average preacher into the used car salesman business. <laughs> put him on the run. But Paul said, I'm ready to preach the gospel. And because he was convinced that the gospel was the only hope for a lost world. And third, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I think there's some things of which we ought to be ashamed. I think we ought to be ashamed when we're negligent. We, we ought to be ashamed when we act a, in a childish way. We, we ought to be ashamed of lukewarmness. We ought to be ashamed of a rebellious attitude. I think there are times we ought to be ashamed of our silence. In a time in our nation where little babies are being killed. Amen. I think we ought to be ashamed to be silent today. But unfortunately, all people are not ashamed of what they do. Jeremiah 6 says, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Oh, they were not ashamed. They couldn't even blush about it. So there are some things of which we ought to be ashamed. But never, ever, ever be ashamed of the gospel. Never. Never be ashamed of the person of the gospel. This is the gospel of Christ. Never be ashamed of Jesus. We ought never, should never be ashamed of the provision of the gospel. It is a power of God unto what? Salvation. That's the provision. That's what's provided by the gospel. Never be ashamed of the plainness of the gospel. The gospel is not some hard to understand thing. 
The gospel truth is knowable. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And Isaiah said, a wayfaring man, though fools shall not err therein. It's so plain, so simple, that a man that is a foolish man can misunderstand it. Does it make any sense to you that God would give his son to die on a Roman cross for the sins of the world, and then turn right around and give us a plan of salvation that was so confusing and so complicated we couldn't understand it. Never be ashamed of the plainness or the simplicity there is in the gospel. We should never be ashamed of the people of the gospel and the people of the gospel whosoever believeth. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and never be ashamed of the plan of the gospel. Some of our preachers, and I say this very cautiously, but I fear that some of our preachers are ashamed of the plan. It's plain, it's simple, it's easy to understand. Go into all of the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, that's one, and he is baptized, that's two shall be saved. That's three. That's pretty easy to understand, isn't it? How hard is that? Let us never be ashamed to preach that baptism is essential to our salvation. Just as faith is essential, just as repentance is essential, baptism is essential to our salvation. Never, ever be ashamed of it. We should never be ashamed of the prospect of the gospel. And the prospect of the gospel is everlasting life. That's the reason in the book of Revelation, in Re Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, John the Revelator describes the gospel there as the everlasting gospel. The, the late T.B. Larimore said, we should be afraid to be ashamed and ashamed to be afraid of the gospel. Paul was adamant about it. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Let me give you three reasons why I believe he wasn't not ashamed of it. Number one, because it's God's power to save a ruined, lost world. Number two, because the gospel is the light for a darkened world. Is there any of us here tonight that would deny that we live in a dark world? You know, when Jesus came into the world, that the world was dark. Spiritual darkness was at midnight when he came. Well, time hasn't changed the world. The world is as dark today as it ever was. Maybe the darkness is deeper, I don't know. And there's a reason for that darkness. Because we've gotten away from the light. God is the father of lights, John, James 1.17 says. And any time you get away from the light, you go into darkness. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4 said, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? Lost. It is hid to them that are lost. You read the new King James that said, who, who's the, those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, blinded them, lest they, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. We have an old dog in the backyard. He's in a, in a pen. It's my granddaughter's dog. I hope she's watching tonight so she'll know I fed Hugo tonight before I came over here. But to get out there, sometimes I don't think about feeding Hugo till it gets dark. And I'll tell you, I get a lantern to go out there to feed Hugo. I don't work too good in the dark. 
And our world is in moral darkness, in spiritual darkness. And the only thing that's going to lighten this old world, folks, that we live in is the gospel. God's word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, John 8, 12. And I think Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because he knew that it was so powerful that it saved the chief of sinners. Think about that. He, when he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1 13, he said, who, He's speaking of himself and in his, in his past, he said, Who before was a persecutor? And he said, I, I, I was injurious to others. I was a blasphemer. He said, I obtained mercy because he did it ignorantly, unbelief. And then down in verse 15, he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world. To me, that's a... <laughs> That just grabbed me one day. I've been reading that for a long time, and one day I came into the world. Why? To save sinners, Paul said, of whom I'm chief. Chief sinner. Paul went from Antioch to Rome preaching the gospel. I, I tried to figure out how far that was. I, I figured it was somewhere between 1,500, maybe 2,000 miles. I don't know. You figure that out. But guess what? He went all the way from Antioch to Rome preaching the gospel. He did it without a car. Believe it or not, he did it without a cell phone. He did it without a computer. He didn't have PowerPoint. He didn't have Facebook. He didn't use Instagram. He didn't even utilize television. Why did he do that? Because like Jeremiah of old, the word of the gospel burned in his heart like a fire. I have come. I have a cell phone. I have an iPad. I, I love my iPad. I can find out anything I want to know with my iPad. So I wanted to make that clear before I tell you a little story, that, a true story. I was in a meeting in North Mississippi, around Fulton, Mississippi, a little country church. Been holding meetings in that little country church since I was 20-something years old. Back a few years ago, one of the ladies came to me when I stand at the door. You know how we do, Brother, Brother B.J. We stand at the door and shake everybody's hand. She said, you know, Brother Billy, what I think we need to do with all these preachers? And I, I was almost afraid to ask her. So guess what? I didn't. Because she's going to tell me anyway. She said, I think we make these computers away from them. And I think we need to put them in their office and lock the door and, and just have a Bible in there. And we need to tell them they can't come out till they know something. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure what Margie did one home to something there. You know, we live in a needy world. I, I, I listened to Brother Clark. I wasn't able to attend last night, but I listened to you, Brother B.J. I heard every word you said. Wasn't that a powerful sermon last night? Amen. I said, wasn't that a powerful sermon last night? Some of you weren't here, were you? <laughs> and it is a needy world. It is a lost world. What do we need? Brethren, do we need churches that draw the masses with gimmicks and games and giveaways and guile? One man told me about his son-in-law 
And his son-in-law is a son of a gospel preacher who many of you would recognize if I mentioned his name, which I will not. And his son began to go to a denominational church and his father-in-law asked him why he did. He said, because they give away bicycles over there. <laughs> At Christmas, they give away bicycles. Do we need preachers that so water down the gospel that it barely causes one to stay awake, much less feel a tinge of conscience that would cause one to make a change in their life. You know, if you preach all of the truth, the devil's going to oppose you, isn't he? But you see, the devil leaves these kind of preachers alone. Preachers that are not preaching the gospel and the full gospel, the whole gospel. Because the devil and these preachers are headed in the same direction. And they're not going to collide because they're going in the same direction. Do we need worship services that are aimed at pleasing the worshiper? By appealing to the lust of the flesh? I'm not a banner maker. I, 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 I'm not much put making PowerPoint. I like it. I like to say it. That was a great one you had last night. That was a good one. But if I were to make a banner about worship, I'd make as big a tall letters as I could, and it would read, It's not about us. It is about God. Worship God, Revelation 22, 9. I just, I'm going to try to stay on my track. Don't say too many amens. <laughs> Brethren, our world needs Jesus. I wish I could get on top of this building and shout so loud that the whole world could hear. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. It needs to hear the gospel. It needs to hear the pure gospel. It needs to hear the whole gospel. <clears throat> oh, I know some think that <laughs> our message needs to change a little bit with culture. Change is inevitable in life. It was the poet Tennyson who said, our great, world for, our great world is forever spinning down the ringing grooves of change. In realms where there are expedients, we, we can make changes. You don't see preachers using bed sheet charts anymore. We use PowerPoint. That, that's a change. And, and many churches, they don't even use songbooks anymore because we have them on the screen. That's a realm of expediency. So there, there's room for change, but the, there's one thing that can never change, and that's the gospel of Christ. Somebody says, well, that Brother Lambert, <clears throat> I'm going to disagree with you. We have a right to be wrong, but go ahead and disagree if you want to. We've got to do things different. <clears throat> We're living in the 21st century. So, well, we need a new gospel for a new age. I'm old enough to remember back in the 70s when people were saying the same thing. I remember what Brother Gus Nichols said about that. He said, people are saying that we need a new gospel for a new age. Because the gospel as we have it today is out of date. He said, God's word will never be out of date. Man is what's out of date. Man hasn't caught up with the Bible yet. And I couldn't agree more. But let me ask you, brethren, if we believe, do you believe tonight the gospel is the power of God to save this world? You say, you believe that? You believe that? But are we growing today? 
according to what is being reported, be it accurate or not, the churches of Christ in the United States are in decline. As at Freed Hardeman Lectures last week, I heard one speaker say, and I can't verify this, but I'm, I'm going to trust him that he's right or close to it at least, that there are 90 congregations of the Lord's Church that are closing their doors per year. According to an article that appeared in the Christian Chronicle, and I don't swallow everything I read in every magazine, but according to that article, we're in a state of decline. Now, I can't say what's going on everywhere. I, I hear a preacher get up and he'll say, you know, everywhere they're doing this and everywhere they're doing that. Well, folks, I've not been everywhere. So I can't tell you what they're doing everywhere. <laughs> But I've lived on the Gulf Coast since 1959. Since I was 16, 16 years old. No, 17 years old. Well, anyway, it's been a long time, however long it was. I may not know what's going on in North Alabama. I may not know what's going on over in Mississippi. I, I preached enough over there. I think I know a little about what's going on. Now, Brother B.J. knows more about that than I do. But I know what's going on in South Alabama. If you were to get on Interstate 65, go 100 miles north, and you draw a line from, from the east side of Alabama across all the way across the state to the west side of Alabama, the churches beneath that line over the last 5, 10, or 15 years have declined. How many of us believe that? Not many of us believe that. Well, I know it's true. I've been in them. Now, it's the case that there are a few bright spots here and there where churches having big numbers and having people to place membership, the few baptisms all along. I thought about this before I said it, and I prayed about saying this. A lot of these that are getting bigger numbers are doing it through what I call checkerboard growth. That is moving members from one square to another square. But the fact is, once we move them from one square to another square, is the kingdom any bigger? No. And what's left behind is a group of discouraged saints. And say, well, they, where they left, they ought to do a better job. Well, what is happening? Why is all of this happening? I, I was talking to Phil Sanders last week at, uh, uh, at Freed Hardeman, and we were just talking about this very issue. And it's a grave issue facing the church all across the nation. Why is it happening? Well, let me ask you, has the gospel lost its power? Is that the reason it's happening? No. Have the fires of hell been extinguished so we don't need to preach the gospel anymore? If you were here last night, you know that's not the case. Has God withdrawn his love and his concern? Is it because people don't want to hear the gospel anymore? I, I don't believe that. There are people that want to hear the gospel. One of the things that, that we have learned in preaching on getting to know your Bible, there are people that are hungry for the truth. They're hungry. I was in Fenwick, Ontario with the Fenwick Church of Christ, a good, strong, solid congregation, sound as a dollar. And on Sunday morning, as a man walked up to me, and he hugged me. I didn't know him. You know, you know I, 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 I said, I guess this is okay. I guess it's all right. He said, Brother Lambert, I want to thank you for teaching me the gospel. 
He, he said, I heard you on television. I took the Bible correspondence course. I called the church here to see if they would be willing to baptize me. And he and Isabel both are faithful members of the Fenwick Church of Christ in Ontario, Canada. He said, I was a Catholic for 60 years. And at least four times, you know what he told me? Thank you for teaching me the gospel. There are people all around us that are saying like those people in Acts 16 and 9, come over and, and help us. Come over and teach us. But it, could it just possibly be, possibly, possibly, that we may not be as convinced today of the gospel's potent power as we should. Could it be that we're no longer convinced that men can be lost without the gospel? Could it be that we do not place a premium on the souls of people? Jesus did. If you want to know how, how Jesus valued a soul, read the 27th chapter of Matthew. Read about his crucifixion. That's how Jesus valued souls. But Jesus asked, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Several years ago, I, I had a Bible study set up one night. I asked one of the men in the congregation if he'd go with me. And we pulled up to this house, actually went up and knocked on the door. We were to start studying the Bible that night, you know. They were not at home. I think it was a calculate, calculated move on their part. I always thought it was. I said, well, since they're not at home, let's just do something else. I said, you know, we've got a young lady, a young teenager that's going to graduate from high school this year. She has never obeyed the gospel, and I've had her on my heart. Let's go see her. But I said, you know, her daddy doesn't like the Church of Christ. I mean, really doesn't like it. I said, so if he's at home, we might not stop. Well, they lived the last house on a dead-end street. We pull up in the driveway. There's Daddy's car. I said, uh-oh. And my first impulse was to put it in reverse. No, it wasn't my impulse. That's what I did. I put it in reverse. I was backing out of the driveway, and then I put on the brake, and I pulled it back down in the drive, and I pulled on up there. I said, let's just go on in there anyway. Suffer the consequence. Whatever we'll talk about. Daddy wasn't even home. I'm not exaggerating. This girl was sitting on ready. She just wanted somebody to ask her. She's ready to be baptized. Anybody could have done it. In 10 minutes time, she and her mother were in the car on the way to the baptistry to be baptized. Now, I have a question for you. Why do you think I put my car in reverse? I'll tell you why. I love her soul enough. If I'd loved that girl's soul like I should have loved it, I wouldn't have let all the devils in hell kept me out of that house, much less her daddy. We've got to have a passion for the souls of people. Maybe we're just not convinced that they will be lost if we don't care the gospel to the lost. 1975, I was in Jacksonville, Florida, preaching in a meeting, and it wasn't exciting exactly where I was. And, but the most exciting thing is about 50 black brethren came on Sunday night and some of them stayed with me till Friday night and, and they amen me, almost preached me to death that week. Well, that night, Brother Charlie McClendon, who was the preacher at the Northside Congregation, led the prayer and, and the preacher there said, you know, they're baptizing a lot of people over there where Brother McClendon is preaching. I said, well, let's go see him. The next day, we went over to where Charlie was preaching and and they built a new building since those days, but I found him, him in one of the most run-down buildings I've ever seen in all my life. You could see daylight that way, that way, that way. Anywhere you look, you could see daylight. They needed a building. And I found him in his office, which was just a closet, 
literally a closet because when he would lean back in his straight chair, he'd lean back against the wall behind him. That's where I found him. I said, Brother Charlie, I said, uh, came over to visit with you. And so he wanted to show me the auditorium. They had an auditorium seat 125. I said, how many members do you have here, Brother Charlie? He said, 450. Now, I've never been good at math, but that didn't figure. I said, I don't understand. You've got an auditorium seat, 125, 450 members. Well, he said, we have two Sunday schools every Sunday morning. We have three worship services every Sunday morning. We have two worship services every Sunday night. And that was until they built a new building, and it's an old building by now. Well, I said, Brother Charlie, they tell me you baptize a lot of people over here. Yes, sir. This was in October of 75. I said, how many have you baptized so far this year? He said, 130. Well, I said, uh, how you doing then? What are you using? You know, that's the preacher question. The preacher question, what are you using? We always want some kind of easy, magical formula, don't we? There's not one, brethren. He said, we're using Jewel Miller film strips. We've got people at Somerdale have never seen them. I said, well, Brother Charlie, you couldn't be doing all of that. He said, no, sir. I said, who's doing it? He said, the members. I said, Brother Charlie, how in the world do you get them to do it? He said, I just tell them they'll go to hell if they don't. <laughs> Listen to me. It is the whole duty of the whole church to preach the whole gospel to the whole world with the whole heart. Now, in case you were sleeping, it is, the, it is the whole duty of the whole church to preach the whole gospel to the whole world with the whole heart. You know, I started at this point to... to, to had a little segment in my notes about excuses, about why we don't do, try to win souls to Christ. But you know, I decided not to do that because I know God doesn't accept them, so why waste my time talking about them? Sometimes people say, there is just no excuse. Well, somebody says, I'm too old. Another says, well, I'm too busy. Another says, I don't know enough. Another says, I've already done my part. You ever heard that? I, I've already done my part. It's for the younger folks now. Or you're just old, Brother Lambert. You're just old and excited. And you don't really know what's going on. I thought that when I was about 25 or 30 years old about preachers that were older than me. That's what I thought about them. And after I got a little older, I found out how smart they were. Well, somebody said, well, Brother Lambert, we just need a, a new way for a new day. That sounds good. How about that? A new way for a new day. Well, brethren, <laughs> for the last number of years, we've tried the new way. How's that working out? How's that working out for us? Folks, we need to get excited about the soul-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to be so excited that we throw off the cloak of lukewarmness and lethargy. We, we need to be so excited that we can hardly contain ourselves. We need to be so excited that we pray this prayer every day. Lord, lead me to some soul today. Teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. We need to be so excited 
that we make a list of those with whom we want to share the gospel. That's being specific, isn't it? Do you have a list? You say, well, I don't know where to start. There's someone that waits on you when you go to have a meal at a restaurant. You have somebody that delivers your mail. You have friends that live next door to you. You have neighbors. Young people have children to go to school with. There are people everywhere that we can talk to about the gospel. There was a young woman that waited on us when we would go to Old Charlie's. She had a very pleasant personality. We got acquainted with her, invited her to come to worship. And she and her two sons, she was a single mother now, and she had two teenage boys, and they would come occasionally. But then she fell out of sight. I learned she had stage four cancer. She sent for me. And Louise and I went to see her. And I said, you know, Missy, we, I want to talk to you about your soul because there's not a thing I can do about your body. But I can help you with your soul. She said, I want you to, Mr. Billy. And I said, if we had plenty of time, I'd take several sessions in teaching you to make sure that you understand everything. But I said, Missy, you don't have lots of time. She said, I know I don't. And so with all of her children and her friends gathered around in a room, listening I taught her the gospel and finally she said I'm ready to go I'm ready to be baptized they helped her get into a car they drove up by a swimming pool there where these apartments complex was and they had a spa and I got in the spa with Missy and immersed her into Christ. You see, we need to see every person as a soul that needs Jesus. One. How many of us tonight? And if you don't want to raise your hand, that's okay. How many of us tonight, I'm going to be the first to raise my hand, know at least one person that we would like to see obey the gospel? Almost every hand is up. And that's all, all, we know one person. I want to encourage you to write that person's name down. Write it down. When you go home, write it on a three by five card. Put it everywhere around your house. Put it in your wallet. Put it in your purse. Everywhere you go, you'll see that person's name. I want to encourage you to be so excited about that person obeying the gospel that you'll start praying every day fervently their salvation and that you'll be so excited that one day when the time is right when you're making some kind of effort in the church to try to get visitors to come that's a good time to invite a person that with kindness love and meekness you'll invite them to visit and to worship with you and that you'll be so excited about the gospel that at the right time, you will ask them this question. Now, this is hard. It's hard to say it if you're not accustomed to saying it. Would you like to study the Bible together? Would you like to study the Bible together? And then be so excited about that 
when they say yes, and many of them, most of them are going to say yes. That if you feel inadequate to teach them yourself, that you'll call your preacher or the youth minister, if you happen to have one, or one of the elders, or one of the teachers, male teachers, someone that will help you lead them to Jesus Christ. Church growth is simple, brethren. You heard Brother, Brother Clark say last night, it's about seed. It is, isn't it? It's just simple. The word of the Lord increased. The number of the disciples multiplied. Doesn't it make sense to you that the more seed we sow, the harvest? And I, and I believe with all my heart, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. Even though I may have sounded a little pessimistic tonight, I'm optimistic about the future. And I believe, brethren, that we can turn it around on the Gulf Coast. I do. I believe that. Just think about it. If all of us tonight that raised our hand and said we've got one person, well, that one person may have a spouse. They may have children. So we're talking about numbers of people that, that we're all here tonight collectively interested in. And if but over the next year you pray about it, you, you be kind and loving and good to that person, and be genuine. Don't fake it because they'll know it. And then get them to visit with you. And then ask them to study with you. If we'll follow through on this, so simple, so simple. Do you realize what will happen this time next year if they come and visit with us in this assembly? We'd have probably twice what we have here tonight, wouldn't we? That's what growth is all about. We have to make a commitment to strive to lead someone to Jesus. The judgment's getting closer. Must I go and empty handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul, not one soul with which to greet. Must I empty handed go? The fields are white to harvest. And Jesus said, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're white to harvest. There's a knock on the door. It's one of the neighbors that lives down the street. They said, we're taking up money to buy flowers for a funeral. They said, whose funeral? You say, whose funeral? I said, your neighbor right across the street from you here. He died last night. And they're going to be having his funeral day after tomorrow. We want to take up flowers for the funeral. And you, you give some money, but you're shocked. Because that's the neighbor you had been intending to talk to about coming to church <coughs> That, that's the neighbor that you thought was one of the nicest persons. You, they, they just were such a good neighbor. But just hadn't gotten around to talking to him yet. The time is short. We don't have forever to do right. And may God help us all to be a soul winner, a soul winner, a soul winner for Jesus.